Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth. Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a lifelong real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder and team leader of Streamlined Properties. Whether you're looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just for a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. If you want to learn about off-market acquisition and home buying on your own, this is a great episode for you. My guests are Jeremy Beland and Dan Toback of REI Freedom Coaching. We're going to talk all about local home buying as a people business. There are a million great tips if you want to get into wholesaling, off-market acquisition yourself, or you just want to understand the dynamics behind how to connect with people and what to do to get them to sell their house to you. Let's go. This is episode 141 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guests, Jeremy Beland and Dan Toback of REI Freedom and also multiple home buying companies. These guys have successfully closed more than 400 off-market properties since 2017. They are entrepreneurs, coaches, and the business owners who are finding houses everywhere. Guys, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for having us on the show. I'm happy to be here today. What's up, guys? All right. Well, yeah, I'm ready to get into some dirt of wholesaling and house acquisition. Let's do it. When, yeah, for both of you separately, when was the first time that you were interested in real estate, though? Dan, let's go start with you, my friend. Yeah, that's a great question. It brings me all the way back to the end of college. So at the end of college, I got a four-year business degree from a small little uh, university here in Florida. And to be honest, I was completely clueless into what I was wanting to do. I had just a, a general business degree. I just wanted to get a J-O-B job and have something <laughs> uh, at a very young age. So I went out to Colorado at the time, which I love Colorado. It's a beautiful place. But I quickly found out with only a couple of months into my employment that the regular nine to five wasn't for me. And my brother, Todd Toback, which probably some of the listeners might be familiar with his name, he invited me out to Collective Genius, ran by uh, Jason Medley at the time, still is. I don't know if he has a partner or, or whatnot, but at that time it was Jason Medley. And I got to meet some awesome people there, Sean Terry, Cody Sperber, Ken Cursini, Billy Alvaro. So there was, there was quite a few people out there that uh, were awesome, so many others as well. So after that, I knew I wanted to do something else. I knew that I wanted to take a step out of the regular nine to five. I just didn't know how to do it. So I started doing bandit signs and some small, low-level marketing in Colorado. Um, I also started calling my brother Todd's list out in California, made a couple of dollars that way. But then my big break came about a year and a half later. My brother, Tom Kroll, was starting PSL Home Buyers in Florida, which was you know at the time my home. So I wanted to go back home. He was doing a few deals. So asked if I wanted to come out there to be his acquisition specialist, which I did. So I flew out to Florida and you know, I've been here ever since over a decade now in business. And the big thing that I remember starting out was, you know, I didn't close deals immediately. You know, I wasn't naturally a salesperson. I didn't come from a sales background. I came from working in a bread baking business, supply chain distribution, and I had no sales experience whatsoever. And I always tell friends this, if I can do it, you can do it. If you're looking to get out of the nine to five, you can absolutely do this business because I started, I struggled. I came from a non-background, anything associated with that and uh, made it work. So, And Dan, you're leaving out the best part. Over those 10 years, how many deals have you personally successfully closed? Oh, over 700, probably closer to 800 at this point here in, in Florida, you know, Treasure Coast area, which Treasure Coast isn't like a large, you know, it's, you know, it's 
fairly sizable, but it's not like I live in a major metro area yeah. and probably close to 800 transactions, lots of joint venture deals as well. All those being single family, I've just been able to stay super focused and specialize in single family. I haven't gotten into like, you know, apartments or anything. Not that those are bad streams either. There's a lot of value there, but I've been able to sustain a really good business over 10 years building just a local brand of a house buyer. And Jonathan, for me, I'm the guy that's actually done the 425 plus deals with my my side of things. I'm trying really hard to catch up with them. It's just he keeps staying ahead of me. I don't know how, but it combined together, we've done over a thousand deals, which is pretty cool. You know, my story's a little different. I'm 47 as of, as we record this today. I started my real estate journey, my home first home buying business at 40. I actually sold my townhouse in 2016 because I was working a six figure job but I didn't really know what direction I was going to go into. And the reason why I did that was because in 2008, 2009, I was learning, I was I had a very successful sales job at then, then 33, 34 years old. And I was looking into, looking into entrepreneurship, direct marketing. I, I came into real estate, decided to learn a little bit from Peter Conti and actually took a Donald Trump university weekend seminar to learn. And I was going to be sat, you know, I read rich dad, poor dad and all those books back then. I was like, all right, I'm going in. And then 2009 recession hit and it knocked me out cold. And I went from making six figures, having the picket white fence, perfect house, you know, a pool, nice cars, and having equity on a house because I just built uh, an addition to a year and a half later being way upside down and out of a job. Couldn't find a job anywhere because if people remember, it wasn't just a, a housing crisis then. It was an employment crisis in yeah. high school education. I never went to college. So I got pushed down that total pole really, really low. So I actually ended up being saved by a real estate investor because I knew enough about real estate to rather than go into foreclosure and bankruptcy, I had a local investor on my buyer's list today, matter of fact, came out, short sailed my house, protected me from foreclosure and bankruptcy. At 33, just before the age cut off, of 34, I went into basic training in the Air Force to learn an education. My nickname was Gramps because I was in there with a bunch of 17 year old kids. <laughs> I came out of that, ended up getting divorced, and um, you know, decided to pull myself back up. And then, you know, as I started to hit 40, I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm. I'm worried about my future. You know, I, this nine to five, it's really uncertain. Um, I'm successful in sales, but is this going to be my life, right? I, I didn't want to have the golden handcuffs. And I was afraid I was replaceable at some point because I've been seeing people, old they get, become more replaceable. So I took a big chance and, you know, I had my townhouse owned for a couple of years. I sold it. I took $11,000 of that, $17,000 in equity. I took $6,000 and used it for my initial marketing spend. $5,000 to pay Dan's brother, Tom Kroll, to teach me how to, wholesale my first house when he was a coach back then and that was it i wholesale my first deal in 90 days in 2017 when i hit the ground running and since then we've gone on with my companies to do over 425 deals since yeah i mean i think the listeners can take from both of you that it doesn't really matter if you have a sales background it really seems like it's motivational for you guys you know you you either needed to have it or you found like hey i'm gonna just figure this out do you think for both of you that was really it you're just focused on doing it like you said dan you're just sticking with single families like that's your jam. I think that a lot of people look at all the shiny objects out there and they're like, oh, well, let me let me get a little self storage and do a little bit industrial. And then they stray from their path of what they're good at. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's where, you know, what I've learned, probably my biggest learning point of the last decade has been focus, having a singular focus. And I think that any time where I've maybe, you know, we've looked at other markets, for example, and try to close deal in other markets or, you know, we try to get into like subject two. You know, we try to get into creative financing. I've always seen a drop, to your point, Jonathan, in the bread and butter of our business because when we're not focused, when like when you're meeting with the seller and you have all these different exit strategies that you're trying to communicate, that comes off very confusing to the seller too. So, from a very relational side, brand building side, when you're able to go into a relationship or when you're getting, going into that rapport building process with the seller that you meet in person. Having that singular focus of, hey, this is how I can help you. Is this a fit or is this not a fit? That's going to be a much more powerful position versus, hey, you know, this is a buffet of things to help. It almost is overbearing to the seller. So anytime we've done that, you know, we've tried before, you know, years ago, we tried a um, basically a multiple choice type of thing where we sent out like three different types of options. It just didn't work for us at least. And I, I think going in with a very laser focus or a specific brand on what you do, it's, it's huge.
Yeah, I also think, and I'll get your take too, Jeremy, the fact that you're focused on building a local brand is really, really important because I feel like there's so many virtual wholesalers now, which really makes no sense to me. Like that's not a really sustainable business. That's like somebody just coming in who's not in real estate, building a real estate investing site. Like you don't know what you're doing. Local is really important because then you can connect to someone. You say you've been in Florida for the 10 years. If you guys are sticking around, do you feel like building that local portal has what helped you stay consistent in your markets? Yeah, I would definitely say for sure. And we're very passionate about that as well. Virtual is definitely very trendy. And I would say very few people are very successful at it, but it, you know what? Yeah. Just think I'm just going to get on the phones and grind, but it's not really sustainable. It's high cancellation rate. It's expensive. It's hot. And it's not really fun, right? You're just sitting on a phone all day. You might as well just be sitting on a phone at a cubicle somewhere. It's basically yeah. the thing. But yeah, we love the home buying stuff as far as being the local brand. Dan has obviously perfected it. You know, back in the day when I was starting my business, I was mirroring a lot of what Dan was doing. And I really mirrored my New Hampshire home buyers, which I live up here originally where we started in 2017 watching Dan from afar from social media, a lot of the stuff that he's done, I've implemented into our business. And as a result, we've become the brand in here in New Hampshire, Mass. We are the leader of home buying businesses. And we have like over a hundred testimonials and Google reviews because over those years, we have become that local people, that local house buying company that everybody knows. And all of our competition knows about us. Like, so it's like, it's weird because we're just regular people. And this is going to sound really like pompous, but like, Sometimes people are like, oh, New Hampshire home buyers is doing something different. We must follow suit. I'm like, what? Who? Just us. But that's because they've seen all of our success over the years. And sometimes we don't realize that because we're just staying singularly focused on what we need to do, you know? Yeah, but that that local nature is really what when you're on the phone or when you get to an appointment and somebody's on Smith Street and you say, hey, we just did three deals over on Adam Street. And the virtual wholesaler doesn't know anything. They're just looking at a Google map. Clearly, you know, it's a different conversation. Dan, are you able to leverage that being in Florida for this last decade, just knowing like, hey, we have seven deals within like a quarter mile of here. That gives you instant credibility. Yeah, absolutely. I like to call that landmarking, right? And when I'm on the phone with sellers, I feel like almost every conversation I reference other deals that we did in the area. And when I'm real lucky, I could actually reference specific people that they might know. Right. Because, yeah. you know, the Treasure Coast, Port St. Lucie, it's not like being in – I shouldn't even say it's like being in like Boston because there's people that you can have that know each other there too. But it's a small enough area where you can build that six spheres of every six person knows each other yeah. thing. But, you know, I reference a lot of people that way and build a lot of rapport that way too. Like, oh, I helped the guy down the street. He worked for this place. Oh, I worked for that place for a year too. I know him. And it does help instant credibility like you said and – being able to give the sellers a sense of comfort, knowing they're dealing with another local, not just a big company without names behind it. Yeah. yeah. I, go so, ahead, Jeremy. I was just going to say, I didn't mean to interrupt, but yeah, for <laughs> sure. I think this has been a proven thing over many, many years of why we have such consistent success in both markets, him in Florida, me in New Hampshire, is because branding ourselves as that local home buyer and building rapport and landmark, and as he says, that's why with our, our students and our coaching program, this is what we teach them. Like, guys, you've got to brand yourself as a local home buyer. So when you go into these appointments, they're going to know that, you, like you said, I flipped seven houses down the street and I'm landmarking and then I know this person. I went to school here. I know somebody from this church. That stuff matters when somebody's desperate and you know in a situation of distress they want to know can this person actually come through and i actually like this person because i can relate to them yeah are you guys finding that i i've always i feel like at least 50 percent, if not 75 percent of the people who are trying to get into wholesaling are really doing it for the wrong reasons they're trying to do it to get money to invest but they don't want to do anything <laughs> they don't realize that you have to run a real business have you encountered that in your coaching and just you know obliterating the other wholesalers in your area who are just like doing one-offs and have no real business sense yeah i think i mean i don't want to speak for dan but i've seen a lot of people come and go during my time very few yeah, have, yeah. right there's only been a few that have been successful and me and one other company are the only ones that have been around and done it at a high level in my market you know and i think dan could say the same for him you know it it's very cool it's trendy right it's like a lot of people love sub two because it's very catchy and it's trendy it's like oh i don't really need any money to be like this millionaire and that may be the case for some people but for a majority of people that doesn't work in virtual wholesaling and you know the, the way they do things it's just you have to run it like a professional business so a lot of people want to come in and they're like i have no money i'm just going to text and i'm going to grind on the phones and yeah. start 
sustainable and they maybe get a deal or they don't want to pay for coaching and they're just going to learn everything from YouTube University, that's great. But if you really want to be successful, you really want to get time freedom and make money and make an impact, you have to treat it like a professional business. Like anything else, if you're going to start a landscaping business, you have to invest into treating it like a professional business because you have a lawnmower. doesn't mean you're a great landscaper. Yeah. No, that's a good point. And I think that's where brand recognition comes into play also over time. You become an entity, even if people don't really understand what you do over time, eventually you show up and and it makes sense. Dan, have you had a similar experience in terms of who's trying to get into wholesaling right now? Because it seems like everybody, their mom, their uncle, and then their nephew are like, hey, wholesaling seems like a great idea. I have no money, no contacts, no buyer list, no properties, but like, yeah, hey, let's go. Let's do wholesaling. Yeah, no, 100%. I think that, you know, do I have I seen companies come in like within the last three to five years that were virtual from some of these like bigger cities like around me? Yes, and they've had success, but I don't see it as being sustained success. All the vendors, all the companies that I know locally in this area, they are truly local and they've they've had that reputation for many years. I think you've even, Jeremy, up by where you are, the same case, people we've talked about, known, have met, including some that we are in the same circles with. We talk about business all the time. But I think that the longer you're in business, like you said, you know, you start to build that momentum as well. You start to build rapport with sellers that even if it's not a yes today to buy my house today, it's going to be a yes a year from now. And you're the first person they have in mind because you've had that rapport building for all that long, that length of time. So I think it always pays off that longevity. The other thing is competing on deals. When you are recognized as a trustworthy brand, you don't compete the same way. And that's yeah. like highest and best. Well, no, I don't compete the same way because they know that I can actually come through and deliver when it yeah. comes to purchasing your home versus just being the highest price. So yeah. yeah. And I would say this too, like we all know the statistics, right? Most small businesses, like 95% of small businesses fail in the first five years. Then the next five years, another 95% of them fail, right? So very few small businesses will make it to 10 years. Dan has successfully been buying homes at the local brand level for a decade. We're approaching eight years. So never mind running a small business that long, which is a great success, but doing it in a real estate market is also a challenge in itself. So those things work. I've yet, and they may be out there. I don't know any virtual wholesalers that have been around for eight plus years. Maybe they're no, the they just cha- they change their name and go to another market and mess it up and get one deal. But you were saying it right before, Dan. I mean, when you're there and you've done 800 deals and you have, Bobby Smith there, who's trying to get his first deal, you don't have the need, you don't have to have that deal for agents, I call it commission breath. It's really the same for wholesalers, they want the spread breath, they want what's in the middle so bad. But the good people when you can walk away, that's when people want you more where you're like, well, this is my price, your price is ridiculous. And you can walk out the door. Like you said, you're likely to get that call in a year after all the dummies like don't close on the properties. And he does. He does. Believe yeah. me. Yes. We had that situation just happen, actually, at, a, at a, a pool home here in Florida, Jeremy, the one in Sebastian. You know, we had a house to where originally they came with a very high price. They were going through a foreclosure that we're trying to stall as we speak. And originally, first conversation, they were way off. When I get there, the price was still way off. But the same appointment, we were able to get the deal under contract because after they seen that I'm a trustworthy buyer, they looked at testimonials. We were able to talk about people that I've worked with in the same neighborhood. After that credibility was built, they realized that it was better to go and work with me now versus experimenting with some out-of-area buyers that were going to negotiate with them at the end of the deal anyway, try to reduce the price the last minute, happened to a neighbor of theirs. So a lot of times, like you said, that credibility, that longevity, you're not only using it to attract, but even within the negotiation, even within the day of, you're still always going back to that and using that in this environment, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, So for both of you, someone who wants to get into wholesaling now, but the right way, like we're trying to tell them right now, what's the like number one trait that you think a new wholesaler needs to be successful? Take massive and perfect action, right? I think they, and patience. It, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, we tell uh, anybody coming into a business like us students, it's going to probably, under good coaching and guidance, it's still probably going to be three or four months before you get your first deal. You may get it sooner, but it's probably going to be three or four months. And then it really is going to take you a year to really build the foundation of something great. That's how long it takes to build momentum because a lot of the deals that we do are from nurturing. So you don't have many leads from nurturing in the first three, six, nine months, but as time goes on, you get more and more and they start to come to fruition. So 
you know, between having patience and realistic expectations and not, not you know, not realizing that uh, everything has to be perfect. You just, you know, learn what you can, go practice. If you make a mistake, that's okay. Just get up and do it again. You know, don't have analysis paralysis. I see a lot of people that I talk to who say, I, I've been wanting to get into real estate for three years as a wholesaler. I'm like, what have you done? Well, I've read every book, but I haven't done, I haven't called a title company yet. Like, what are you waiting for? I pick up the phone. I know it weighs a thousand pounds, but pick it up and call somebody, you know? Yeah, what about you, Dan? Number one trait for a new wholesaler? Integrity. Uh, that's a great that's yeah. great you have to you have to really care about the person the people that you're meeting because you're never going to be able to connect with them and be able to practically use empathy if you don't sincerely care you can care about them as a means to an end and i would argue most people do that most people are able to do that even the worst of us but i think if you can't get to the point where you can see them and say man that's a hard situation and i'm only a bad decision or two away from being in that same situation, all of us are, then I don't think you can serve them as well. And I think that if you can, if you're not there already, I think that's your first step is to be able to see people that way and to be able to say, hey, listen, am I truly helping? Am I okay with telling them that I'm not the best answer if there's a yeah. best way? And we have stuff like that, that happen all the time. Both uh, Eddie, you know, who's up in, he's he's awesome, by the way, Eddie Lorenzo up in New England, our New England market. And then, you know, what I've been doing down here is to be able to actually eliminate yourself as an option yeah. if you're truly not a fit. And I think that the common thread between all the highly successful acquisition specialists, solopreneurs, sole proprietors that I see is being able to see that at le that level. So yeah, that's a great one. And I think it comes from really the thought of the way that I look at wholesaling or off market acquisition is it's not about the money. It's about solving a problem. So when you walk in and you say, how can I help you? That's a different question than say, like, how much cash can I give you when none of them really have cash anyway. So it's kind of a silly conversation. But you guys know, would you agree? Like, we're really just trying to solve a problem off market. First, we have to know where they're going. If they're not going anywhere and they don't know where, how we're not buying the house because they have nowhere to go. But usually it is. It's more of a problem. They have too much stuff in the house. Somebody just died. They don't know what to do with it. Their brother's a jerk. They, they're fighting with the heirs. You know, they have to clean out the house. There's always something else you can do. And if you offer help first, I think you're going to be in a much better spot, like you're saying. And that's based on integrity. Do you guys agree with that? Hundred percent, Jonathan. You couldn't be more right with any of that. You know, that's the reason why, you know, Dan and Eddie and myself, we get deals all the time for less money than our competition right. because they're going in. Maybe they're virtual enough, but they're coming in a place like I'm just going to offer you more. But you know, like me, when I was in 2009 in the recession and I'm losing my house, you know. I wasn't really worried about money as much as I needed certainty. I needed to make sure that I could trust this person to actually follow through, right? If it's somebody I'm talking to in another state, I have no idea if this person's going to follow through, right? Yeah. Like, a place of integrity, like, I have a problem. So Dan and Eddie, you know, these people have a problem. And the bet we have to bring creative solutions every day, bring value in exchange for equity in their homes. That's all we do. The house is a commodity. We're a people service. We're providing a service by helping people. Right. And that's what we're going to do first and foremost. And if you're really good at that and you really care, the numbers will show as a result of from success. Yeah. If you just look across the over 1,000 sales, just a quick guesstimate on what percentage are owner occupied versus absentee owners, because that'll help people understand how you build lists and what you're looking for. It's a great question. I haven't done that data, but I'd probably say it's somewhere around 70, 30, 80, 20. Yeah, for, for owner occupants on the high number. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Dan? That's what I was thinking yeah. just based on how you guys are talking. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think that if I told, I don't know who I told this to, it was a, somebody at a mastermind a couple of years ago that I attended, and they were very surprised by that. But it's one of our, again, this it, it works back into being that local brand because the people who live here in our market, right, they're the ones who know. They know yeah. who the players are. They know who are, are the, who has the ability to perform, who has that longevity. So I think it actually benefits those who are operating in their backyard versus the virtual model. And I think that you also have a lot of better access being in person to those people to actually get in front of them for meetings, things like that. So there's a lot of practical benefits, a lot of practical advantages for that uh, data as well. Yeah. yeah. 
I would say that, you know, with absentee owners, yes, they have distress, right? There's times when they have bad tenants or bad landlords or they're in over their head and they have to sell at a discount because they do have problems. But most of the time, I think that clientele or that seller is very different than somebody who's owner-occupied facing true distress. Yeah. You know, maybe like a slum lord, you know, and looking to just sell for as highest and best, and they may have a distressed property, but they may not have any distress themselves, whereas people that we're typically dealing with, like all the examples you gave earlier, are people that really truly need help, and uh, it, you know, so it's minimal on the absentee side, they do exist, but um, you know, one out of ten, two out of ten at best, I bet. Yeah, well, I mean, because you guys are working a person-to-person business, which is going to trend towards owner-occupant, so then it's one-to-one, like us to them, and your absentee owners are investors. Those are completely different pitches just for everybody out there. Your pitch to an owner-occupant is, how can I help you? You know, this person outside, it's like, why do you still want this property? Those are, you know, you're dealing with someone who maybe started like yourself in wholesaling, and now they're just in California. That's different. But Dan, I have a question for you, because it's specific to Florida. If you can buy all these houses... Where are these people going? Because in the Northeast, like Jeremy knows, we're like, oh, cool. They're all going to Florida. But where are they going from Florida? If they're old, are they going to nursing homes? Like, where are these people going? Like, you can get their house. <laughs> That's a great question. So it's actually interesting. So where I'm in at Port St. Lucie, the growth of Florida on the eastern seaboard is pretty straightforward. You have Fort Lauderdale and Miami. That South Florida, true South Florida area. It's growing northward on the eastern seaboard. The West Coast is actually different. So. Yeah. We were, then you have West Palm Beach, then you have like Delray in that area, and then you start working right up to where I am. Our area now is becoming more expensive, it's becoming more populous. So now you have a lot of people who this may not be affordable where I am anymore, Port St. Lucie. So they're actually bumping up. They're going to Indian River, which is like yeah. zero. They're going inward to Okeechobee. They're going to Georgia, in some cases, Tennessee. So a lot of them, there are some older folks who are going into assisted facilities. So there is that demographic. But a lot of them are moving either they're going to rentals, cheaper rentals. They're going to you know the middle of the state, northern part. And then Georgia and Tennessee are two probably the most popular places that I hear a lot of my sellers that are going to out of state, but there are, they are still relocating because cost of living right where I am is becoming obscene. Like property taxes are high insurance. insurance <laughs> nuts. So it's, it's actually getting pretty unaffordable. Yeah, no, that, that makes, that makes more sense. It's just like in the Northeast, Jeremy knows you're always like, Oh, you guys are going to check out for warmer weather, but it makes sense for them to go in a different part of the South, especially with rising insurance costs. But John, as I know, is cool about that. So there is still the ability to get into some emerging markets for the equity game, like some areas that Dan is saying, like just north of him, just west of them. It's small and affordable now. You can buy cash flowing single family still in these areas. Oh, yeah. Up. We can up here in the Northeast. So you can, um, you know, buy them and then just sit on them five, seven years because that population is going to continue to grow. Let's face it. Everybody's moving to Florida. Florida doesn't want us, but I'm sorry. We're all going because that's the best place to be right now. So uh, it's a good place to buy and hold too if you're looking. Yeah, I agree. I, so I lived in Florida for 14 years, actually. I lived seven in Fort Lauderdale, seven in Sarasota. So I know the landscape and I did a bunch of flipping. I didn't really do active like hard sell acquisition at the time because I was still a lawyer then. But I've always found it to be a market that if you're if this town doesn't work, you can find a town within like 20 minutes that works. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's always a town with because Florida is such like an odd place. It's so transient that if one market goes up, you just go two towns over and something's going to happen. I mean, I, I remember being in South in, in Sarasota, you know, they're building all these new developments and people are like, oh, no one's going to live there. And now everybody lives there because they don't want to live that close to the water anymore. I mean, that's, yep. Florida adjustments happen all the time. Oh, yeah. Yep. Hey, it's Jonathan. This is just a brief interlude to talk to you about Deal Machine. Listen, I've used Deal Machine and I was crushing it with my Concerned Citizen postcard on Deal Machine. You can look that video up on my YouTube and find out how I did it. It works, Deal Machine works. I've had David Lecko, the CEO on the podcast. So if you want a free trial of Deal Machine, the elite driving for dollars app, and I'm telling you, it works if you use it correctly, you can go to my link at bit.ly slash Zen Deal Machine. Now, bit.ly is bit.ly slash Zen Deal Machine.
it's free and you'll be up and running in two minutes and then you can figure out if you want to keep it. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, so, uh, well, we got the number one things for you guys for wholesalers, but where do you think regular, just in general, your competition as wholesalers are going wrong? When they lose to you, what is one thing that you know that they're doing wrong that can maybe help someone not put their foot in the mud? Well, I think Dan would probably be better to answer this question because he's boots on the ground more. But from my experience, it's people that just focus on money. You know, they think money is an end-all, be-all. So kind of like what we were talking about earlier, they go in, they're not building rapport. They're not trying to solve a problem. They're just like, well, you need a roof. You need, you know, you need yeah. Right, the best offer I can do is this, and when you make it about money, then the seller gets defensive and backs up. It's kind of like you know anybody gets into like a negotiation, everybody gets defensive and nobody wins, right? I I always try to use the example like when you go to um, a car dealership and you're going to buy a car, right? You're out in the parking lot looking at the cars, and all of a sudden you feel the salesman creeping up behind you, right? And he comes up to you, he's like, "How can I help you?" And everybody just says, "No, we're just looking." Because right? you don't want to be pressured into sales. But when you talk about money and make it all about money, that's the kind of uh, feeling you make for the seller in the kind of environment. And everybody's just going to draw a line in the sand and nobody's going to step over it. Nobody wins. So that's my my feeling on that. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Go John. Ahead, Dan. Right. Yeah, well, I was just going to say you, you become like a walking bandit sign. You know, bandit signs made sense back in the day, but then you have to follow up on that quick cash pull and it, it it doesn't really work. What do you think, Dan, based on what you see out there in the market? Because I know like for everyone, anyone who doesn't know, when you're in wholesaling, you show up to a lot of appointments and there's like seven or eight people there. Yeah. You know, so you know who you're up against. Where are they screwing up? Well, I think that they don't ask enough questions to learn about the seller and truly what they're looking for. The deal in Sebastian the pool home that I just referred to earlier that uh, Jeremy and I are working on down here that particular seller actually mentioned they had four to five other people. And some of those people even sent them offers in the mail, like the checks. So they already had higher offers. One offer yeah. was like 50 or 60 grand more than I could pay. And they still went with me. But the reason is they don't know that person. They don't know who that other voice is on, this, on the other end of the phone. Yeah. That person didn't come out to meet with them and talk with them for an hour and understand them as people or know about why they're even selling, know about their family situation, know their, you know, why they've hesitated getting out of foreclosure for a year. So people generally feel more comfortable working with somebody that they like and that they know. And right now, the way certain people are running their business models, they're not giving themselves that time to get to know the seller. They're just trying to throw a bunch of stuff at a wall and wait to see what sticks. In a market where there's lots of opportunity and it's up and to the right all the time, that may not be a bad strategy. And a lot of people were able to do that. But now, with more players in the market, you have to stand up, set yourself apart. So we were able to really benefit off of being able to have boots in the ground, meet with them, get to know them. The other thing, though, is that what I would say, and sort of a, a second leg to that is, just say you're up against two other local guys, then you have to start building your skills to what kind of questions are you asking? Because if we're all three of us are local, we may be three great people, you like us all, but you have to pick one. Yeah. So the questions, you're not asking powerful enough questions to really be able to have the seller open up to you to provide them the solution that they need. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, besides price, what's most important to you in this transaction? Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you know, that's a great offer. Why didn't you take that when Bob, my competitor, was here? Why didn't you take Bob's offer? Because that seems like a great offer. So you have to learn to ask questions that elicit responses that truly give you uh, helpful information to serve the seller. Yeah, those are great points. And I want to get your take both on this, because I've found that new wholesalers who don't undergo any training, uh, especially when they're working pre foreclosures or foreclosures, they lead with that. And I'm like, you can't just lead by telling someone, you know, they're in foreclosure, you might as well punch them in the face and tell them that they can't do anything right financially. So it's a very soft conversation. I would always I, my dialogue is always like the county records, which are always wrong, by the way, indicate that there might be a list pendants on here. I know it's probably wrong, but that's how we got your number. What do you guys do on a lead into a pre-foreclosure? Because that's where I feel like your your virtual people are just always crapping the bed. They call up, hi, Bob, we see you're in foreclosure. Like, you're, you're not winning that. You just told them that they can't afford their house. It's a terrible lead. 
Yeah, it's like dealing with somebody in probate, right? And you have to be very sensitive in that situation. You know, this is why there's a need for coaching and sales training in this industry. And, you know, I've been very passionate about coaching and sales training, not because we have our own, but because I invested so much in it to get to a point where we are today. And if it wasn't for Dan's brothers, you know, I would have never been able to achieve so much success learning that. And, you know, a lot of people just feel like they can learn everything from YouTube University, but you can't learn that. Now you need somebody who has experience that teaches you the right questions to ask, how to handle things, and you know, work in delicate situations. Everybody's like, "Well, I've done sales my whole life." Well, that's great. That's business to business. You're not talking <laughs> about somebody who's a controller. You're talking about somebody who's facing foreclosure or just lost a loved one. Very different situation. You have to handle it differently. Then, what, what, what do you see? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that, you know, it depends on the foreclosure too, because most of the time that comes out anyway, when I'm asking why they're selling. Yeah, right, right. When I use when I use the right type of questions and the right type of mentality, sellers tend to open up because, you know, you're asking, well, it sounds like a great property. You lived here for 25 years. I'm kind of going back to this deal again. You know, you've been here for over 25 years. You mentioned how great the neighbors are. What's the reason y'all are, are relocating? Why not just stay here, clean the property up? Well, to be honest, we can't afford our payments. We haven't made a payment in a year. And that's where you start to kind of deduct like what's really going on. And then you can become more of a helper. And you're not just there kind of interrogating, pointing out the flaws. All that does make people feel bad. You're not really um, giving them comfort at that point, right? So there is a, there's a certain level of bedside manner that you do need in this business for sure. And be able to ask the right questions the right way to be able to get proactive. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just want to piggyback on that because in that situation, you know, especially like, you know, a lot of people, like, they're really embarrassed, right? They're hurt. Exactly. When I went through my short sale in 2009, like, I was ashamed. I was in, I was in depression, right? The last thing I want to do is open up to some stranger I don't know and, and feel just, I already feel inferior as it is. Now I've got to explain to somebody I don't know everything that's going on. That's not easy for somebody to do. But for somebody like Dan, who's a master at talking to them and making them feel safe and, and safe enough to, you know, be truthful and transparent about how they're feeling, what they're going through, so we can actually provide a better solution. It's no easy task. And if you don't handle that with kids' gloves, it can really go south in a hurry. Yeah, and I think it goes to what Dan said before. That's real empathy because you're trying to connect to the person and see what you can do to help. Because uh, you guys have been in it, I've been in it. You know, sometimes you show up to a house, you think it's going to be okay, and you walk inside, it's either a hoarder's house or like a really bad situation. Like a lot of kids, it's dirty. You know, you have to feel bad. Maybe I don't really, I don't enjoy being in hoarder's houses. You know, it's uncomfortable for me because I feel really, I personally feel like claustrophobic, but. I'm there to try to help, but uh, you have to develop that empathy or you just walk in and walk out. You know, sometimes the house doesn't smell good, but you're still trying to figure out what you can do. Have you guys been in those situations where it's really like, this isn't about, I can't buy this house right now, but I got to do something because this is, this is bad. hundred percent. And that's why with our sales process and what the way we coach it's empathy for us. And Dan is the master at that. And, you know, Dan is our main coach. And when he teaches us students, it's all about coming from a place of empathy. And Dan, like you're outstanding at doing this better than anybody I've ever seen. Yeah. I think, you know, when, again, it comes always down to the person and not the house, right? So when we see trouble with the house, it always just is a symptom of something much deeper with the person. So our goal is to always understand what's going on with the person because ultimately, at the end of the day, the success you have in this business is just a byproduct of how you and how well you serve people. Yeah. How well you're able to create a solution that it's good for them. It's great for them. It's going to give them a springboard into improving their life. So I always share with my students, hey, try to get it to a personal level. Try to move it from the house to, you know, why are you in a position? You know, why are we in this position now? Tell me your story. Where did you come from? Like, how long have you been here? Do you have family supporting you? Who do you have in your corner? And sometimes the questions, they move from the house. And I think maybe out of, you know, 95% of my time to 97% of my time is spent actually on the person and on their situation, on their emotion yep. versus the actual talking about the repairs, talking about why it's a hoarder home. Why are people having all this stuff in the house? Well, it's because it's something on, you know, personal, something internal. And that's where we're really trying to come in at. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's important to note that you can have true empathy, be of help, and also make money. 
like we're we're out there to try to make money too. I think some people look at it and it's like, oh, well, you must be lying to them, you know, to try to get the sale. It's like, no, you you can do both. And I've always told people when I'm off market, you know, hey, that number doesn't work for me. I'm an investor. I'd love to help you, but like I also I'm here to make money. That's why you know, we're trying to do this. It doesn't work for me. I'm happy to connect you with someone else who wants to pay that. But that's really like, you know, an on market price. Is that something that you've seen? I mean, you both seem like you have, you're you doing it for the right reasons. It's help first empathy. And that is coachable, but some people might not be able to do it because they don't feel it. You know, if they're just thinking about the money and then trying to be empathetic. Yeah. You know, I think most people are empathetic to begin with. Some, some people just aren't in anything they do in life. We never come across any issues with anybody that we know personally in our coaching program or that work in our companies that have been like that. You know, everybody seems really like good natured people. And we probably surround ourselves with those people on purpose. Right. And, you know, that's why we want to, everything we do is we want to be transparent. Transparency is going, you know, going to be the the situation that provides the most success in this business. You know, honesty in everything we do, be it, as Dan's older brother Todd would say, be a truth seeker and a truth teller. If you do those two things coming from a place of empathy, then, you know, a lot of times you're going to help a lot of people out. And that sometimes means you don't get the deal. We still right. help somebody. And we've helped a lot of people where we didn't buy their house, but they gave us a reference to somebody else later on that we ended up buying the house. And we're like, how did you hear about us? Oh, you talked to so-and-so about a year ago. They ended up going in a different direction thanks to your help. But they just loved how nice you were and how helpful you were. Yeah, transparency is really important. I've always said that if real estate as a whole, from wholesaling all the way up to the on-market business, was just more transparent, it would be much easier. And those of us who are transparent always do better. You know, yes. Because in wholesaling, the problem a lot of the time is that wholesalers either intentionally don't or do not know how to explain what wholesaling is to the seller. And then the seller finds out that there's a spread involved at the end. And then they're like, oh, you lied to me. How, how, how do you guys combat that when you're trying to be transparent about how the process of wholesaling works? But it's helpful for you guys and other people to know that you can direct acquire the property. So if you do wholesale properties, it's usually overage or ones that don't work for you, right? Yeah, so I'll answer that question for us, but Dan will be better to answer the other question. Yeah, we, you know, we keep saying wholesalers, but we're just experts. You know, we started out as wholesaling. Yes, we do wholesaling, but we are experts at acquiring off-market properties. That's what we master. Master all the skills to acquire off-market properties. We have many multiple exit strategies, and we use them all for depending on the property. So, yes, we can definitely close on properties, and that changes things. But if you are a wholesaler and you don't have the funds or means to – physically close on a property. Dan, how would you handle that situation? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So I think that either way, even if you are buying the property direct for a discount or wholesaling it, b both are true where you need the property at a discount. Okay. So yeah. the questions have to be targeted to your seller that are they okay with you making a profit? Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you know, I'm in this business to make a profit. Would me making needing to make a profit prevent us from doing business? Right? Does me needing to make money on this prevent us from doing business? Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you know, you can get more money by improving the home's condition and then listing it. Have you considered listing it? Have you considered renting it? It sounds like if the property's in a great spot, great rental area, have you ever considered holding on to it for a few years and then maybe selling? You always want to be asking your seller to fire you. You always do. It doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't matter how motivated they are. I always ask my seller why they're having me in the room. Always. It doesn't matter if they're calling me hot, like, hey, I need your help. I'm desperate. I'm still asking all those questions because I want to build our relationship, build a rapport on authenticity and really knowing that I'm the best fit for them. And that's where you can eliminate a lot of those questions. When it comes to wholesaling or assigning of contracts, you just have to build in the expectation that during the inspection, other investors are going to be in there and something that if they ask me, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I sell the property. I'm going to be reselling this property no matter what. I'm not keeping it. It's either going to be resold now or resold later. Does that prevent us from doing business? So you always want to be completely transparent what's going on and you always want to be asking the seller, hey, does this prevent us from working together? I'd rather know now than later. Yeah. Yeah. You're coming from a place of transparency and empathy, right? And you're providing a value. A lot of times that's more important to them than the money. And if you're being honest about what your exit strategies are, whether that's assigning it to another buyer, right? And you're going to make money on it. A lot of times they don't care who's going to buy the property. They don't care how much money you're going to make. They just want to know, 
can you come through on what you said you're going to do to help me? And that's all they care about. A lot of times we hear is like, I hope you make as much money as you want. I don't care about how much money you make. Just help me. So that's why coming from a place of empathy and being transparent is critical for success in this business. Yeah. And I mean, across the board for the listeners, the three of us can, can tell everybody that we will always get deals that are less than what other people can get them for just because we're either transparent, empathetic, been in the game a long time, know how to talk to them or are truly trying to help. You're, you, you're just going to get better deals. They'd rather do the deal with you. You know, it's just, it, it happens all the time. I mean, there's hundreds and thousands of stories of people who got properties, you know, away from someone who was, you know, whatever, some fake hedge fund buyer who can, you know, close anything, you know, they get another open door offer versus somebody who's like, hey, you live in the neighborhood. It's just like silly what they're trying to do to the investing world. But it's nice to know that if you keep the boots on the ground, people can be successful. I just want to get your take on this before we hop off. I mean, because you were saying before, like, it's really important to be patient, Jeremy. How important is it for them to really know that going in? Because I think our entire everybody really in general society now is obsessed with short term goals. But if you want to be good in any form of real estate investing, you have to be really looking long term. So you're building something like you guys have. Yeah, I mean, I think even when I came into this business, I, I was like, oh, I'll do it for five years and I'll retire. Like, ridiculous, right? It, it's, a, it's a combination of both, right? So you can get rich quick, right? It, it just really depends on what your definition of rich is, right? If you're able to make $100,000 a year and work a few hours a, a week and able to live a great lifestyle, at home, that is rich to somebody. It may not be millions of dollars, but that's still a f form of rich. Um, but I just, you know, I tell people, like, it takes time to get your first deal. It takes a full year to really build the foundation to something great. A lot of times people in year two will see a two, three, four X on what they did in year one because you're building momentum, you're learning those skills. But at the end of the day, I did 10 deals for $73,000 in year one. As I stand here today, I'm approaching $10 million in over 425 deals. That's seven, oh, even more than seven years. That to me is getting rich pretty damn quick. You know, it, it, it may not be seven days or seven months. <laughs> I mean, where else can you achieve that kind of wealth and that kind of opportunity in such a short time frame? Now, listen, I'm not swimming in uh, a bank of uh, gold coins like Scrooge McDuck because I invested back into my team and learning. And, you know, my time is more valuable than money. So I could probably work more and make more, but I'd rather pay more people on my team so I could have more time. But you just got to be patient. It's not going to happen overnight. But again, if you invest into coaching, be consistent, take massive and perfect action, your life can completely change in three to five years. And that's pretty freaking short. Yeah, I agree. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, no, I, for me, it's, it's definitely a mix of things. I, I think that it's always about the long game. If you're in this for, this is definitely not a get rich or, you know, hit the moon, you know, in, in a couple of weeks, that's, there's some rare cases that I know of where people start to make <laughs> right to the moon. I, um, you know, I think that if you're looking to do that, like off the bat, you know, maybe try another business. But this is definitely more uh, for somebody who has a long vision. Hey, at least a year. <laughs> like, you yeah. have to give yourself at least a year in this business because I can't tell you how many stories where you may send out a postcard. I talk to my students about this all the time. You invest $1,500 cash, $3,000 cash in direct mail. That person gets that card and they may call you back in three months, six months, 12 months, two right. years. I mean, Eddie is probably even better than I am at some of those long-term deals like years down the road. Truly, if you could marry that rapport building with, you know, hustle side of trying to get things done quick, plus that follow-up game, that's like the perfect acquisition specialist. Yeah. That's the perfect, you know, uh, sole proprietor because it takes both. You need to have a hustle mentality. You should be wanting to hit the moon and serve as many people as possible in the next week or two. But that's great. That's a great ambition. But you also need to have longevity in mind as well. So when you marry those two, that's really where you start to expedite success long term. So for me, success looks like, hey, what are my daily habits? What are my weekly goals, my monthly goals, yearly? Am I on top of them? How's my follow-ups? How you know? Am I digging deep with sellers? Am I building massive rapport? Are my sellers like me? If somebody called them and said, hey, was he likable? Are they going to say yes? So all of that is, is success. And I think that if you make it like a, a monetary number at the end of the month, I think you'll be disappointed in this business. I don't know if it's for you. Yeah. 
Um, so let me throw this out there before I get to where everyone can find your coaching program. I have found that in coaching programs, it's not just the material. I think the material is secondary to the connections you make with the other people in the coaching group. Those become your JV partners, future partners. And I think a lot of people take that for granted. They're like, oh, well, I don't want to do the workbook. And they like don't connect with the other people. But I've seen mastermind after mastermind. Those are like friends for life. Have you guys found that? And then I'll follow up on where to get in touch with you about your coaching program. Some of my best friends in this business are excited out as people I paid to learn from. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is the way it goes. I'm happy to keep paying people to learn from and get in the same room as them because getting in the same room and learning from them has made me better year after year after year. And I'll never stop doing it. Yeah. What about you, Dan? I mean, has that been a part of your journey? Obviously, from what you told us before, with just, just talking to your brothers, hey, let me get a ride on this. Uh, that that seemed to work for you as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've been very blessed to meet a lot of people. But, you know, I've made a lot of money, too, from people that I've met in, in different groups, you know, whether it's Wholesaling Inc. or whether it was, you know, the masterminds that I've been a part of, whether it's been just, you know, events, just a singular event that I pay to go to that one event. And then yeah. I meet people, you know, it's, it's all part of it, you know, cash buyers in our group. I really love how our, our students leverage each other. And I always encourage them that every week I say, hey, listen, buddy up, you know, if, if you you know, bought too many leads lists, have one of the other students <laughs> in the group call it for you and then team up, you know, so your your network is truly your net worth. It, it's tied in together. The more you can leverage um, not only talented people or people with experience, but trustworthy people with integrity. And that's a lot of times what we're seeing in our group, people being able to ask each other questions and being able to uh, give authentic responses to truly help them meet their goals. So it's great. 100%. You just got to have mirror, you know, abundance mindset with um, you know collaboration two of those things go together really well and you can just do a lot of great things with great people yeah uh, i agree uh, so tell us where you buy homes so everybody knows and then at the end just tell us where they can get in touch with you guys about rei freedom yeah so we buy houses up in new hampshire massachusetts up in the new england market and then uh, the treasure coast which is like port st Lucie, vero beach and that area the um, south east side of florida always buying and um you know we are cash buyers as well we're not just wholesalers but we are cash buyers so definitely for that and as far as connecting with us you know best place is to you know come to our Facebook page which is rei freedom if you come and join our uh rei freedom facebook group i'm sorry if you come there and join there's a lot of great things that we give away, like our top sales five techniques and a, a, a couple other freebies. But the best thing is Dan's in there almost every day doing live free coaching. So if you heard what you heard today, and believe me, Dan is the master at acquisitions, join our Facebook group. You, you, you want to join a group? Great. If you don't, we don't want you. But you got to at least come to the Facebook group and watch Dan every day because he's going to provide you a lot of great value. And uh, it's going to help you succeed a lot more than you already are for sure. Yeah. Awesome, guys. Well, I really appreciate the time. I'm glad we got in touch. I think that was a, a, a quick masterclass on how to do wholesaling and acquisition the right way. And I yeah. really do think it's important for new investors to learn because they're getting bad advice from fake gurus about how to do it. And the the person to person is really where it's at. So thanks so much, guys, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, all right. That was Jeremy Beeland and Dan Toback from REI Freedom. I'm Jonathan Green. We'll see you next episode. Wait, you have reached the end of the show. This is the part where you're going to get ready to check out, but I've actually changed this part. For over 120 episodes, you heard the same thing. Well, now I've changed it. I've thought about doing intros to the next episode, but I'm going to hold off on that for now. These are my pitches at the end. I've got nothing to sell you at all, but I do want to remind you that it really would help us if you support the podcast in the right way. All that means is subscribing to the podcast so you get it on Monday and Thursday, writing us a five-star review if you believe that we deserve a five-star review, sharing it with your friends, and being a participant in the Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing community. Soon there's going to be a new website launched. Maybe when you're listening to this, it's already going to be out there. That's where we're going to have collaboration. You're going to be able to see a lot from the guest. It is coming soon. And I just want to tell you, from me to you, I don't know how I got here. Over 100 episodes. I'm so appreciative of you listening to the podcast and especially sticking around to hear this part. We'll see you next episode.